Hello, welcome to the Friday, January 8th, 2021 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Rob today started a series of diaries that he'll be publishing over the next uh, couple days, couple weeks, about parsing and using the National Vulnerability Database. NIST publishes this database and it's sort of the authoritative source of vulnerability information and offers a nice structured view of vulnerabilities. For example, you can query the database by products and products are organized using standardized strings or CPEs, the common platform enumeration. So many tools like for example Nmap will for example create output that includes uh, this uh, common platform enumeration string and then you can quickly feed that into the NVD API in order to retrieve related vulnerabilities. With Rob's diary, you get some samples and an introduction into the information that is available via NVD and also tools that allow you to retrieve and organize the data. And security researchers from Ninja Lab uh, took a closer look at the Google Titan security key. And while they did find a site channel vulnerability, I think they actually prove that exploitation of this vulnerability is not exactly practical. If you're not familiar with Google Titan, it's a key that implements the U2F or FIDO2 protocol that can be used for authentication. There are a couple different versions of it, either with USB, Bluetooth low energy, or with uh, NFC interfaces. And essentially a browser, for example, is able to send a challenge uh, to the key that will uh, then be digitally signed and returned uh, to uh, the browser to prove a particular individual's identity. And of course, the big advantage of a token like this compared to, let's say, Google Authenticator or other soft tokens is that it should be very hard to impossible to actually copy these security keys. In order to copy the security key, you need to be able to retrieve a secret that's embedded in the key. And that's exactly what they did here. Now, it's actually not possible to directly read out the key. But what they did is they opened up the key, attached oscilloscope probes to it, and then had the key perform cryptographic operations and used the electric signals that they observed to then reverse or derive the secret key of this particular token. So a potential attack scenario would be that you leave your key unattended and an attacker would be able to get a hold of the key. They would be able to perform this attack and then copy the key without you noticing. Now, the problem here, of course, is uh, they have to physically open the key. And one thing the researchers noted is that they were not able and didn't really see an obvious way how to open the key without destroying the outer casing of the key. So it wouldn't be possible to return the key without the victim noticing that someone tampered with the key. Yes, they were able to conduct the site channel attack, but it's not really a practical exploitable vulnerability. Still, I think the paper makes a real good read because it goes into all the little details in how these tokens work and uh, how the protocols uh, work in order to authenticate you here. So uh, still feel like uh, this is a worthwhile paper to mention. And they're also really not uh, making uh, this uh, vulnerability any bigger than it is. And Google Chrome extensions remain an interesting problem that Google and others have a hard time sort of getting a handle on. The register has an interesting story about the Create Suspender add-on. 
It's a very popular add-on with about 2 million downloads. And essentially what it does is it suspends any tabs that you're currently not using, freeing up resources for the actively used tabs. The problem here was, and that has happened a number of times before, that the original developer of uh, this add-on sold the add-on to an unknown buyer. And of course, whenever something like this happens, there is no notice to users or such that now some different entity is responsible for any future updates. And of course, updates are often applied automatically. But this case also shows how difficult it can be to figure out if certain behavior of an extension is malicious. And in this case, it's, well, really not clear. It was noted that the application started to connect to various services, but then it was suggested again that these are just sort of alternatives uh, to essentially Google Analytics uh, that uh, the extension connects to. Later, an update was released and uh, this suspicious behavior was no longer Observe. So the end result was that uh, the extension is still available in uh, Google's web store and it's not malicious, in particular not in its current form. The Microsoft Edge version does block uh, version 718, but not the latest version 719, which had this suspicious uh, script removed. So at this point, uh, all looks good with this extension, but this is something that has happened sadly multiple times before where extensions changed owner and then turned malicious. And well, it's Friday, so today we have another sans.edu student uh, with us. Brian, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, I'm Brian Nishida. I'm a digital forensic examiner, and I just recently graduated from the MSISE program. So all done with it. And your paper, well, of course, as a forensic examiner, it was about forensics. Can you give us a very brief overview of what your paper was about? Yes. So my paper was about finding artifacts for uh, Ubuntu Linux. And these types of artifacts are more for the point and click type actions that a user does. Being a heavy Linux user myself, usually you look like you know, at your bash history and uh, syslog stuff and such. But of course, things change a little bit uh, when you're uh, using the full uh, GUI in uh, Linux. What were some of the things that you found? Like you know, in bash history, if I run a program, it's from my shell. It's pretty much there in bash history. Uh, what happens when I click on an icon on a desktop? Yeah, so for example, Wireshark, you can invoke from the command line or from just clicking on an icon. So if you click on an icon, you won't show up in the bash history, but there are other Linux logs that show uh, that Wireshark was run. And also Ubuntu keeps track of your frequent apps. So there's a location you can look at to see that Wireshark was run and the last data was run. Any idea when an application is being added to the frequent or favorite apps and uh, how long it stays there? No, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know when, how long it stays there. I just know that the um, what happens is it's given a score. There's, there's a, an actual text-based file, um, and then it has a score. It's a relative use value. And then it has a Linux date um, that you could parse with a date command. Um, but these things, after a while, if you don't use them, they disappear from frequent apps. Um, but if if a person recently used them, you'll you'll see it show up. Now, another issue, of course, uh, with uh, sort of forensics is always uh, removable media. Uh, in the command line world, uh, you know, I have like my mount commands and things like this that my that I may find in a in a bash history. Uh, I probably see something about like an SD, uh, whatever, you know, drive being connected in Syslog. Uh, how does this all reflect itself uh, when you're sort of using the uh, GUI uh, version of Ubuntu? Yeah, so what happens in, in a lot of versions of Linux, not just Ubuntu, but uh, a USB flash drive will auto mount. Um, and when this happens, you could look in the system journal file or some logs It'll give the make, model, and serial number of the uh, flash drive as well as a user who used it. 
and the mount point of the flash drive. And also you'll see uh, the mount point will always begin with media slash media slash username and then the volume name. Um, what happens is that a person, when they open a file on that flash drive, you'll see a slash media slash username. So you can tell that was from a flash drive. Um, and then there are uh, places in what's called Google or GNOME tracker that also when those mount points are created, get logged. So basically, you know uh, the serial number of the drive that the user connected, you know the mount point used. Are you able to identify files being copied to from the drive or is that not so, really hard? Yes, you can. Um, it's, it's a little subtle though. Um, so you could copy a file and if you open it, there's another GNOME artifact on recent files. That sh and if you just look at the path, you could tell it was from a USB drive. But if even if a per person never opened it, but um, just copied it over to uh, the local drive, um, you won't be able to tell it came from the, the a USB flash drive, but you could see these um, files that were copied over and, and not yet opened. Okay, and uh, where would you find that information? About? Is this in the recent files? Uh, the files were just copied, not opened, or? Uh, uh, no, so recent files, you have to actually open the files. But there's this uh, feature of GNOME called the GNOME Tracker, and it's in Ubuntu 20 by default. And what happens is, is you add documents and audio files and pictures and video files, they automatically start getting indexed by GNOME. And so these files, although they're never opened, they show up and you could even delete them without opening them. But once they touch your hard drive and start the indexing process starts, you'll see remnants of them. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So it's kind of like, um, I think Mac OS does that too, where it's spotlight or so, where it automatically indexes files as, as soon as you add them to the system. So it's a similar... Uh, system they have here to make it easier than to find files is that sort of the idea yeah that's why that's how they created it but we as forensic uh, examiners can take advantage of that for uh, finding artifacts yeah now another thing of course an attacker uh, may do uh, in particular of insider is like install additional tools uh, again you know in the command line uh, I'm a little bit more sort of historically a CentOS guy, but you had sort of RPM, you know, that was kind of locked. Uh, I guess app, there are similar locks in, in Ubuntu and Debian distributions. Uh, if I just, you know, basically download a file with my browser and uh, then double click on some installer on the uh, on in the GUI, is that also locked in, in those locks or where would I find that? Yes, yeah, so there's uh, several places for logs for uh, APD installs. There's a history log and a term log. Um, and then for things like snap or D package, you will also see things in um, just the kernel log, the system log and the system journal files. Uh, they show that the, the time of the install, what was installed, package dependencies, and the UID uh, who installed it. Pretty much you can follow the user sort of from mouse click to mouse click kind of, you know, as they install, as they, as they run tools, as they, as they copy files, uh, that could all be presence. And I assume you have also your standard browser, uh, uh forensics files, like you know, your browser history and things like that. Yeah. So my research, because the browser forensics is, uh, pretty well known and the, uh, we have a lot of commercial tools for those. I did not cover those, although they're very important. But you know, SQLite databases, just like you would have in Windows, would be used uh, on the Linux side. Yeah, so that's uh, pretty nice. Uh, any other sort of uh, neat things that you found or that you ran into when you uh, did that research? Yeah, so one of the things that was interesting was uh, when you, a user goes to a folder, things like pictures, um, thumbnails are created for pictures and PDF files. And in these thumbnails, there is a URL of the source file. So a user can go to a uh, folder, even if it's on a USB flash drive, not open any of the pictures on there, but those pictures will, uh, will be, thumbnails will be generated for those pictures along with the full file path of those pictures and that will all be captured in a GNOME uh, thumbnail cache. 
Okay, so that's not actually on the on the thumb drive then, but that's in your home directory, in the GNOME cache directory, where you would find these thumbnails. Yes, it's uh, you. You actually find them under the user profile. Okay, now that that's really cool. I guess you have to be a little bit careful there. That really finding these uh, thumbnails just means they looked at the directory. They haven't necessarily opened one of those images, sir. That's correct. But what it, that does, though, is it kind of gives us an insight as to what was in a particular directory. Right. Yeah. yeah. And what about if, uh, like, for example, the uh, USB stick was encrypted? Would you still find those thumbnails unencrypted in the profile? Yes. As long as they typed in the password and opened those folders, yes, you would see those. Yeah, that's uh, pretty neat. So you're all done now with the decree. What are you doing with all the free time? <laughs> so I, well, I plan next to try to get my CISSP uh, certification. So I'll be preparing for that. Thanks a lot for joining me here. And uh, thanks everybody for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.